This Lent, our worship series is called Wandering Heart, and it focuses on the figure of Peter. And as we watch Peter encounter his life, encounter Jesus, encounter his faith in different times, we learn something about our faith through him. At least that's the hope. This week is another Jesus story that turns into a Peter story. It comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. May God add understanding to the hearing of these words. And will you pray with me, please? Holy and gracious God, be within us and among us as we turn our hearts and our minds to you. Amen. There's a really good book up here. You guys are not, <laughs> you guys can't see it, but it's really good. It's called Timmy Turtle in You Can't Catch Me. That's next week's sermon. So I read stories like this, and sometimes I wonder why I don't get it, meaning understand Jesus fully, or why my understanding of Jesus keeps shifting through my life. And sometimes I am jealous of the disciples who got to know him face to face. They had a front row seat, and I like to think that if I got to see it with my own eyes, I would have understood. But I don't really think so. First, because I don't really understand everybody who's in front of me right now. And most of you are probably not God in human form. I don't think. But also because those same disciples who did see it and live it, even with their first-hand experience, they didn't always fully get it. Jesus is always one of the most popular answers in those, if you could have dinner with anyone from the past, kind of thought experiments, who would it be? A lot of people say Jesus. I would probably say Jesus. If that were an option, I would have a hard time not saying that if I had the chance to see for myself. But it does make me wonder what I would be expecting to experience. I mean, not physically. For some reason, I have this sense of who would walk into the room. There is no indication that Jesus was anything other than a fairly normal first century working class Middle Eastern man. Indeed. <laughs> but what would I feel and see and understand if he was just right there. I think we think Jesus would feel very different just to be around. He would feel different than anybody else we'd ever experienced before. And maybe he would be. But more often than not, I suspect that our real experience, the real revelation of that moment would be how actually ordinary he was. The surprise would be that he was way more normal than we expected. And I guess this in part because that's how people seemed to experience him then. After a couple hundred years, Christians who never met him thought of him as God, begotten of God, one with God, but not at the time, or at least it wasn't obvious. He met thousands and thousands of people and even in these stories that were written to convince people that he was the Messiah, 
Most of those people who met him didn't think that about him. Most of the people who met him and heard him and saw him and were even fed by him and healed by him and taught directly by him, they weren't convinced. Most left their experience of Jesus, maybe impressed, but not thinking you are the son of the living God. And so it wasn't a given. And even those who spent every waking hour of their lives with him at this point, the disciples, at least at this point, even they weren't sure. But in this story, for a moment, Peter gets close. There is something wonderful. This is my third week in a row saying this, but I want us to remember it. There is something wonderful about Jesus' love for Peter. At least in part because if God loves us the way Jesus loves Peter, and I think that's true, then that is wonderful news. There's hope for all of us. What Peter seems to have as we accumulate these impressions of him week to week, what Peter seems to have was a bold, authentic, enthusiastic, childlike faith. He was curious and hopeful and trusting enough to say yes when Jesus said, follow me. He was courageous enough to step out of the boat and walk on the water to Jesus while the rest of his, heads, while the rest of his friends were stuck in fear in the boat. And here he has the faith to think big, to dream big. He could see more than the others could see or at least were willing to say. And Jesus loved him for that. He praises him for that. So Jesus affirms this in him. To be fair, though, it's also Peter next week who will get stuck in thinking way too small. And Jesus rebukes him really harshly for this. So that's in him too, but that's next week. But if that's going to be a correction, a no, today's story is a lesson in positive reinforcement. This is Jesus saying, yes, more of this. And not just in yes, as in well done, you've, you've figured it out. But even more than that, Jesus says, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, which says something way more than you guessed right or you learned well from me. This is saying God revealed this to you. So not only is Peter thinking big and gets on the right track, he is now in a place, Jesus says, where he is hearing from God directly, discerning the truth himself, connected himself with God. And in the way last week, when for a moment Peter participated in whatever power Jesus had access to and walked on water for a moment, Here, Peter is again, maybe only for a moment, but again, in a real way, getting a glimpse of the fullness of what's happening. So like the transfiguration up on the mountain, he sees it, but he can't hold on to it. Like the walking on the water, it doesn't last long and he gets in over his head. But at least for a moment, as we'll say over and over about Peter, at least for a moment, he is able to see here what others can't see. Or at least he's willing to claim what others won't yet say out loud. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus doesn't just like this or agree with this. He takes this as a sign that Peter is now ready for what's next. He blesses him because of it. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter, which in the Greek is a play on the word for rock. And on this rock, Peter, I will build my church. And this is another way that who Peter was, as inconstant and imperfect as Peter was, there's something about who he was, Peter would one day be the right one, not just to be allowed to be a part of it, but the right one to lead. I titled this sermon on Wednesday, and you may not look at the sermon sermon titles or care about the sermon titles, but it means I have regrets, and so now you have to hear about them. Lessons in thinking big is great. It's part of it. I wish I had called it lessons in good questions because I think that's the better focus. Because for us, on some level, it doesn't matter how Peter answered once or how, Peter, how big Peter could think then. What matters is how we answer now 
one of the best and most eternally relevant questions Jesus ever asked. Who do you say that I am? For someone that was that connected with God, someone who didn't argue when he was called son of the living God, someone who those who followed him would eventually call God, for being all those things, it is amazing to me how little Jesus told his disciples about who he was. It's one of the reasons we still struggle to know exactly how Jesus thought about himself, who he thought he was, because he said so little about it. And when he did, it was this sort of euphemistic and mysterious way with things like the Son of Man. And then even when the disciples seem to figure out a piece of it, he sternly orders them not to tell anyone about him. You would think he could just tell them. Name it and claim it, as they say. This is who I am. If you want to be my followers, you have to believe this about me. This is who I am. It is amazing here that he doesn't say, hey, I just wanted you guys to know that I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. I hope you figured that out by now. But if not, I thought I would just tell you. And instead, he teaches through questions. He tries to draw it out of them. He challenges them over and over again to wrestle with it themselves, to come up with the answers themselves, to listen to themselves, to think about what they actually think, not just what they think he wants them to say. He wants them to draw what they believe out of themselves. In part because their understanding of Jesus, and maybe even Jesus' own understanding of himself, is still evolving. It was changing every day. And not just the public perception of what they were doing, but their own sense of what was happening, what they were doing, who they were, it was changing. And on some level, Jesus seems to know it doesn't matter where he wanted them to be. It mattered where they actually were. And this is a way of asking, so where are you on this? And in the same way, it doesn't matter what I tell you. It matters what you choose to give your heart to, what you believe. Jesus wants them, as I said, to discover things, to grow into, the th them, to grow into things themselves. And to claim these things when they were ready on their own terms. And so instead of telling them what he wants them to believe, he brings them over and over again to what he thinks is the right question. There is a place in religion and there's a place in relationships for obedience, for discipline. Sometimes we need someone to tell us what to do. Hopefully we all have someone in our lives that we trust enough to do what they say. But any relationship that runs on because I said so isn't a relationship. It's domination. And Jesus wanted more with his disciples than that. He wanted more out of his relationship with his disciples than that. God wants more from us than that. And so God, or the Holy Spirit, or life, or whatever you want to call it, will keep bringing us to the good, big, right questions again and again. Who do you say that I am? Not what does Pastor Aaron say, not what did you learn one day in Sunday school, not does what, what does your spouse think, what do you want your kids to think. What do you believe? And we're free to answer honestly. And I hope we do. And I think in that same way, I think our job here in worship sometimes is not to answer these questions for one another, but to kind of forward these questions on to you. I'm not going to tell you what to believe so that you can spend your time agreeing with me or disagreeing with me or obeying me or not obeying me. I'm going to challenge you to answer the question for yourself. Who is Jesus to you? Who is God to you? No one can answer it for you. How you answer it will say a lot. If you choose to not answer it, you already have for now. 
one last piece of the sermon because there's one last piece of this scripture. After Peter's proclamation of faith and Jesus promised to him, Jesus gives him, and in other tellings of the story, he gives to all the disciples, but he gives to Peter here what he calls the, king, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Not the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that's a different thing, but the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth, which is the language of binding and weaving in and connecting in, whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth, let go of, disconnect, will be loosed in heaven. This wasn't about going to heaven someday or going to hell someday. I cannot say that enough. That's not how Jesus thought about the world. That's not what he was trying to teach here. His faith then, our faith now, is not about some system of eternal reward or punishment. The kingdom of heaven Jesus was talking about was here and now for living. So Jesus' mission statement is, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, repent and believe in the good news. It's not, believe in God so you can go to heaven someday. So the kingdom of heaven that he knew, and the kingdom of heaven he was trying to get everyone to see and live in, was here and now. It was for his disciples, it is for us, this place of peace and joy and justice and goodness and abundance that is within us and among us is the kingdom of God. Which means if you can live in that place, if you can find that place, even for a moment, then you know where it is. And if you know where it is, you share in the responsibility of getting other people there too. So when you are giving the keys of the kingdom of, of heaven, it's not that you get to choose who's in and who's out. It's that people need to find it through you. You're not a gatekeeper, you're a guide. Right? You're not a security guard, you're a locksmith. You're here to help other people get in. Too many Christians read this, I have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and they think that they've been given the authority to keep who they don't like out. But what they've actually been given is the responsibility to go out and help people who are looking to find it get in. This is still our responsibility. And there is maybe no, no more clear or urgent example of this than, and Brock is giving us a great example, than the little ones that we baptize. You could sum up all of the promises we just made Brock into one question. Will you do everything you can to help them find the kingdom of heaven? And I don't mean when their lives end someday, where will they go? I mean while they live, will you do everything you can to help them find the kingdom of heaven? Everything we promise is a way of saying we will strive to be the ones through whom they will find the way into the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect. It does mean you have to try. Claim what you do believe, not just who we're against. There is nothing like children to confront us with the questions again, wait, what do we actually believe then? What world do we want to show them? Peter had the faith to face the good, big, real questions. And then to answer them boldly, when he probably didn't completely know what he meant, he knew what he believed, or at least he knew what he wanted to believe, which is on the way. So all of us can take a lesson from Jesus' teaching in Peter's faith. To those in our care, bring them to the right questions. Show them by who you are how you have answered them. Be honest about everything you don't yet understand, which is most of it. Be there for them every step of the way as they grow into their own answers. And someday, they might be inspired to think even bigger than we could. Thanks be to God.